just like to, to thank the sponsors and everybody that's involved with this, with this debate. First of all, um, is the, the Institute for Islamic Service. You can see their posters and get more information from them outside. Um, Brooklyn gereformeerde kerk, Griffel in, in Loretele, specific Juventus. Um, in fact, it's their idea that we have a debate on campus um, and they've also hosted a debate with, a, with an atheist or so in the past. So thank you to Brooklyn gereformeerde kerk. Of course, Antwerp Apologetic Ministry, then Dialoog Church or Dialoog Community, the church that I'm involved with. I can see there's a couple of you guys here. It's good to see you. And then the IPCI, obviously. Now, uh, we've been working with the IPCI. This is the second time, and I can really say it's, 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 it's a privilege to work with you guys. And uh, it's, it's a second event, and so far it's, it's really just been a pr privilege. Now, I'm reminding you, I just said it briefly, that tomorrow's debate will take place at Rietvallei. Um, it's across Vartikloof High School on the corner of Boeing Street and Hans Stradom, one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, these guys will take on each other again. Now, I'm supposed to to introduce the moderator for tonight's debate. Before I do that, I just want to say, um, you saw the book tables outside. If you want to order a DVD of both these debates, you can either do it through Antwoord or you can do it through IPCI. I'm going to introduce the moderator. <clears throat> now, he's a pretty impressive guy, except for the fact that he bring, didn't bring me a CV along. Ishmael Kala. Now, Ishmael is the CEO of Amka Productions. I, f I think I'm reading this right. He, is, he was a founder of the Muslim youth movement in the 1970s. He is vice president, almost I said VIP, he is vice president of the Islamic Council of South Africa and he worked with the late Ahmed Didat from the age of 17. So he knew him obviously for a very long time. He's a successful businessman in the Pretoria area and he's also author of the book Unleash the Power of God Within You. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for our moderator for this evening, Ishmael Kala. We thank Almighty God for blessing us with this opportunity as spiritual beings having this material experience. We've come from a dimension that is timeless, that is eternal. The day we were born, the countdown began for our spiritual journey back home. The meeting today is to understand the different faiths. There's no competition, we're just having a scholarly debate. Our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, he who knows himself knows his Lord. And he, whoever wants to meet his Creator, whoever loves to meet his Creator, his Creator loves to meet him. And he dies not who gives his life to learning. And he further says, we must learn something every day or we will age faster. So if we are not reading, then we're going to age faster. Jesus Christ says, the noble messenger of Allah, Jesus Christ, may, peace, may the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon him, says, whoever learns the inner meanings of these truths will live forever in the eternal sea. And Muhammad says the same thing, different words. Both are messengers of God. I would like to introduce our brother Yusuf Ismail. He's become law, studied at the University of Deb in Westville, and LLB in the Natal University. He was admitted to the bar as an advocate in 2005, <clears throat> but has now gone back to the sidebar and practices full-time as an attorney. He's involved in interfaith department at the Islamic Propagation Center International, founded by the late Ahmad Didat, where he coordinates discussions with individuals from different faiths, communities, and is regularly involved in debates with several prominent personalities from the Christian faith. Most recently, he had debates with Dr. William Lane Craig from California and Dr. John Azuma from the London School of Theology. He's involved also in diverse issues in politics, contemporary culture, and religion. He's a really versatile scholar. I would like to call upon uh, 
Is Yusuf Ismail going to be the first speaker? I'd like to call upon Brother Yusuf Ismail to address you. Gentlemen, let's maintain order. No clapping hands in between his speech. At the end, you can have an applause, but try and let's maintain decorum. Thank you very much. God bless. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I begin in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the generous introduction. My learned colleague, Mr. John Gilchrist, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you with the greetings of peace, which is Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty God be upon all of you. Let me start off with the idea that we the people, both Christians and Muslims, can be described, as many people have done in the past, as an endangered species. But unlike the endangered flora and fauna that, that you see around you, no one is in fact making an attempt per se to campaign for our right to survive. You, we, find the, we, we, we face the same particular threat as the Indian tiger, but no one is campaigning for our right to survive. If you look at both Islam and Christianity, both faiths, both are basically moral religions. In other words, they define God-human relationships in moral rather than in Gnostic or cultic terms. Both have a common prophetic heritage in the line of the Abrahamic tradition. There's a common goal in terms of establishing the kingdom of God on earth. And so it's not surprising then that in both religions, doctrinal assertions on the nature of God, on the role of the different apostles' missions, etc., have become a source by and large of internal conflict and somehow we as individuals Christians and Muslims might need to put aside our differences only partly in fighting a common enemy and that particularly is secularism which is the can be described as the AIDS of our time or the acquired inhuman domination syndrome of our time and indeed in its most recent panic offspring postmodernism most of you at university will probably be familiar with this phenomenon of postmodernism so at the outset we are endangered species. No one takes religion seriously anymore. You look at the popular culture, news, uh, international affairs, religion is secondary per se. More than that, you find that a moral homelessness per se creates a vacuum that sometimes produces a certain profound uncertainty as you see in parts of Europe. A fractured society Civic virtues have been relegated to ceremonial display. And one way of sublime discomfort when organized religion falls down, what happens? People go again and look for other spiritual paths. There is a return to religion, but sometimes that return is in extreme forms, in different manifestations. According to John Nisbet and Patricia Aberdeen, they wrote a book called Megatrends 2000, 10 New Directions for the 1990s, and they state that there has been a shift amongst people in the third world and the West, a revival of religious belief, but this particular revival in the last two decades resulting in approximately over 600 million people turning to religion, many of them have turned to extreme forms of their particular faith. Sometimes. Um, uh, as is often the case, the return of religion has been the two extreme forms of fundamentalism and sometimes personal spiritual experience. The personal spiritual experience in the sense of which the variety of cults seem to basically be having a field day. Something which is very common nowadays is the New Age religion, the New Age phenomenon. The so-called practitioners that come and are appointed or basically given legitimacy. People like Deepak Chopra, uh, the so-called spiritual gurus, who charge you thousands at a particular time in order that people may get some kind of spiritual satisfaction in their life because organized religion has basically let them down. So moral homelessness creates a vacuum as a result of which there is a return in religion, but that form of return is normally accompanied in particularly extreme forms. What some would describe as a bastardized form of spirituality, but that's another issue. Now if we are to move from a situation of distrust to one of trust, 
from the, and, and viewing each other as friends, then by and large we must try and understand, at least remove, the basic forms of distrust that divides us. What causes a particular distrust? Find a common ground. One of the main particular forms of distrust, what I would describe in the context of today's debate, the experiential distrust or the academic distrust. Here you've got a famous book called City of God by St. Augustine. What you find historically is that Christianity adopted a Hellenistic dualism, what can be described of body, feeling and spirit. A dualism that you don't find in the Bible, but you find in St. Augustine's interpretation of Christianity. Most of Catholic and Protestant life, by and large, is based on Augustine's interpretation of Christianity. What he did in his book, The City of God, he divided humanity into two groups living in two different cities. The earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point where you have a contempt and hatred of God. And the, earth, the, the, the heavenly city was the love for God created by the contempt or hatred for oneself. Augustine, per se, as many scholars have noted, was concerned only with loyalty to God, for that particular loyalty was to ensure that all else will fall into place. And so what was the commandment he gave? He told Christians in history, love God and do what you want. And so you find, unfortunately, historically, they did what they want to the detriment of humanity, in the line of Augustine's interpretation of Christianity. And, and so it's the dualism which comes from the Hellenistic Roman um, um, and, and religion and religious philosophy. Now, the experiential mistrust, as I stated, is a natural outcome of the Augustinian tradition of dualism. Those who love God today, being more, or who love the world today, being more philosophically powerful, have subjugated those who love God. And so in a sense then, Christianity, or the conventional sense, has become a handmaiden to secularism. How so? How has it become a handmaiden to secularism? We've got an individual here called Brian Swim. He's written a book called Manifesto for Global Civilization. And in it, he basically says, Specifically the presumption that original sin is a valid starting point for spiritual living must be let go of. The preoccupation of Augustine with his own guilt must be let go of. His confusion of church with kingdom needs to be let go of and his fear of women or particularly the patriarchal ideas that he had needs to be let go of. And so many of Augustine's philosophical and theological presuppositions continue to haunt Western spirituality up until this day. Many other Christians who indirectly would believe the ideology of Augustine then they would accept the particular belief in Jesus Christ. So, in, in a sense, that is a problem that we basically face with. Now, if that is the case, if people who philosophically love the world, who being philosophically more powerful than those who love God, have become um, subjugated those who love God, then not surprisingly then, Christianity has become a handmaiden to secularism. Christianity or conventional Christianity today always seems to choose secularism or go in accordance with where secularism goes. If you look at contemporary Western secularism being the product of a conflict between science and the church that took place between the 16th and the 17th centuries, secularism dethroned the powerful church, the ruling orthodoxy, the powerful institution, and gave rise to a society which has captivated the Western mind for the past 300 years. Now, that's fine. There were great advances in science. There were great advances in technology. But it perpetuated a hidden delusion that human nature and society can be fitted into particular categories. You can manage it. And so what happened was that transmission from the religious devotion from the church to the concerns of the church changed to the concerns of the particular world. 
Contrary to popular belief, secularism doesn't produce a decline in religiosity. It doesn't produce a decline in religion. But what it does do is it decries the, transfers the religious devotion from the church to the rational concerns of this world. And what's the result of this? The result of this you find spawning Nazism, Communism, Scientism, Postmodernism, all these different isms which are basically a product um, arising as a result of the Enlightenment and as a result of which the devotion changes from one end to the next end. If you look at the grand narrative of secularism, what was it? It was a cornerstone of the European imperialists. And what did they do? Their universal mission was not just to dominate the world, but to secularize and restructure it in the context of the European man. European imperialism was not just simply content to simply occupy people's cultures, but to mentally occupy their minds as well. And not surprisingly then, as a result of which you find two leading scholars or philosophers, one is called Soren Kierkegaard, the other is Friedrich Nietzsche, who basically stated that as a result of this, they argued, secularism has become a product of the Christian faith. And in more recent times, you find Christian scholars like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, etc., who give the indication that they're quite happy to concede that human beings can resolve all the issues without invoking God. You don't need to invoke a God at all. You can resolve your issues without Him. So, as a result of this then, the evaporation, according to Edmund Norman, of any sense of religious tradition in human life has been one of the most decisive changes in the Christian experience. Instead of modifying or rejecting Christian culture, the most influential of Christian thinkers have adopted secularism. And that's why it's so easy to have a division between the church and the state. You hear this all the time. People say, I'm a man of the cloth. I leave the politics to the politicians. What kind of nonsense is that? You're a slave. That's what you are. Whether you're a Muslim or a Christian, if you basically have subjugated your minds to secularism, then your faith is meaningless in the 21st century. Regardless of what your religion is. You can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian, but if you've subjugated by secularism, if you subject your worldview to the secularist enterprise, then you are a slave. And therefore, following that argument, if there is hardly any difference in terms of the attitudes and morals between most Christians or liberal Christian and, and secularists, it's not surprising then that you have people like this, Reverend Don Cupid, where he proclaims quite proudly, left-wing postmodernists like me are turning religion into fine art. If that is the case, if people now are seeking of reducing religion, taking a reductionist approach to religion, why do you not turn to the actual source itself? Go towards postmodernist art or the postmodernist fiction to find some kind of spiritual guidance. Like Rushdie himself, all his novels are postmodernist novels. He said he sought um, to fill the God-shaped hole in his heart with fiction. And that's what people are turning to. And unfortunately, as Edward Norman continues, because of that, no one looks to the church, you know, use the church generically here uh, for social teaching. Nobody. Even the fears of the impending global chaos or annihilation, they don't elicit religious responses. Catastrophe, overpopulation, um, poverty, nuclear warfare, proliferation of nuclear warfare. It's discussed or debated or understood in accordance with the particular secular norms. And they've given a religious growth. And if most Christians, in conventional Christians, have, have, have accepted the ideals of secularism, then it's not surprising that you find missions, missionaries per se, what they do is that they exhibit major characteristics of liberal secularism, imperialistic tendencies, dehumanization, domination, meaningless. If there's not much difference between the norms of secularism and Christianity, then Christianity or the conventional variety becomes meaningless, at least in moral and social terms, if it becomes an appendage to secularism. 
Its only option is to recede inwardly and to seek or become a faith of purely personal salvation. But even as a faith of personal salvation, based on the notion that salvation can only be accepted through accepting the divinity of Christ, Christianity today cannot cast aside the imperialistic tendencies. And so having been relegated to a secondary status in Western society, what happens? It goes on to the third world. And in the third world you find um, it, it basically basically engages in whatever tendencies it takes upon, but it's open to debate whether the new converts basically accept Christianity uh, from personal conviction or as a means of escaping poverty. Look, this is a practical example, and without being judgmental here, many people were shocked when they described or looked at Germaine Greer's description of Mother Teresa as a religious imperialist. But if you were to look at Mother Teresa's nuns in action when she was operating, you'd find that there was an innate sense of superiority that was either a product of a secularized Christianity or more probably a creed of personal salvation. She had no humility when it came to the Catholicism. She was ministering to the poor not for the sake of the fact that they are victims of a colossal system of injustice, not because of poverty is as a result of this global capitalist system, but because of a variety of Christianity. And so Germaine gives you two examples here. She says, first picture, a young man emaciated dying. Second, none in a white and blue sari tugging at her arm. Third, none hailing a passing rickshaw. Fourth, a gaunt rickshaw puller begging not to have to take the dying man. Fifth, none commanding two bewildered passers-by to live the dying man. Sixth, the anguished rickshaw puller running through the traffic with the dying man behind. Seven, the dying man sat at the wall of the corridor where all unconscious of bed and baptism awaiting him, he died. Now, Greer asks the question, why could not the little nun sit by the pavement, shake his head from the sun, and pray with him until it was all over? Because, Greer continues, that humanity, the immediate needs of the individual, were not part of Teresa's business. She was primarily in the business of saving souls for God, not in the business, per se, of challenging the rampant global capitalist system or eradicating poverty. That was incidental. The main aim was salvation. And so the arrogant enterprise of introducing or having to save souls for God is also the business of introducing liberal secularism. You look at this organization here. It's called the Wycliffe Bible Translation, one of the world's largest Protestant missionary organizations with branches in 40 different countries. The actual missionary work carried here is on behalf of a group called the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which is linked up to groups and organizations like the CIA. And what happens when these institutes go into the third world countries, not only do they open it up to multinational prospectors and multinational companies, but what they also do, they engage in forced sterilization of the innocents, population control. So the missionaries then try to change the societies from into prototypes of the American capitalist and consumer culture, a, a transformation that in certain instances ends up killing the particular tribes. Their work might be extreme, but missionary work generally in the West tends to produce westernized elites in the third world. Christianity, like Islam, is oriental in religion. And that's, there's no debate on that. But in the imagination of the Christian elites of the third world, the holy family is blonde. And so even the idea or the concept of God, someone who, the loving father in heaven with all due apologies to Gandalf the Grey, but the concept, the anthropomorphous concept that you have of God is superimposed on people in the third world. So the idea in the past, Black is devil, white is God. It becomes far more easier when you conscientize people into believing and certainly with an anthropomorphous idea, you colonize them. I'm not saying that that's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't have the idea that God is like uh, the loving father in heaven or the pictures that we see of someone looking like Gandalf. But the point is that the consciousness, subconsciously, that's what people believe. This, the, the final point, what I would call the academic mistrust, a great deal has been written about the academic mistrust, and here we will deal with something or limit ourselves to what we would call Orientalism. Orientalism was, and indeed was much a product, of European imperialistic racism 
as of certain Christian missionary zeal. Now Muslims of course do not object to scholarly criticism of Islam or the Quran which is totally acceptable and you have the right to do that. But they do object and they must object to remolding of Islam in Christian or secularist notions. And they object to the principle that the wide currency that exists in universities throughout the world that Muslims per se cannot be trusted to be objective about their religion. I mean you go to the school, I mean this was Peter the Venerable, um, one of the earliest polemicists on Islam, but we don't have time to go into that. This is a school for Oriental and African studies in London. Most of the teachers that you find teaching Islamic studies happen to be people, uh, some of them from the evangelical background, some of them from the Christian background. I just met someone last year, uh, the London School of Theology teaching Islamic studies. But you don't have the opposite. You don't have a situation where someone from the Muslim background teaches another faith. It's viewed as bias. It doesn't happen. You always have it the other way around. And so Shabir Akhtar basically writes that it is empirically testable claim that in the West Islam is never taught by able intellectuals who embrace its inspiration. In any case, why should Islam be singled out? given that Christians teach Christianity, Buddhists teach Buddhism and so on. And would any liberal Western university allow Muslims to teach Christianity to balance the fact that Christians teach Islam? You won't have it. It doesn't happen. So there is academic mistrust that exists. And as a result of which down the rabbit hole we go, the concept that you have, the idea, just like in Alice in Wonderland here, down the rabbit hole, there's always a warped particular concept in terms of what you have, misconceptions abound throughout. Now, these are what you would call here whores for the political establishment in the United States. I know they probably look more comfortable in strip clubs, but the two individuals, one is an individual called Robert Spencer, the other is a lady called Pamela Geller. Pamela Geller um, is uh, well, firstly, Robert Spencer is an expert and purportedly an expert contributes to the New York Times and many mainstream newspapers. He has a website blog called jihadwatch.org. He's an expert on jihad. And this lady here, do you know what her expertise is? She's used by Fox News all the time. Apparently, she's an expert on Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. I know it sounds quite strange, but these are the kind of individuals that influence people in positions of power. Look at Fox News. You'd see her all the time making comments. These are right-wing contributors with particular agendas, and the agendas are then used to shape the policies that you find in American society today. Not surprisingly, you have people in administrations. I, I love this here. Oh shit, he's dumber than I thought. But it's people like this here who are basically influenced by these right-wing Christian, uh, by these right-wing contributors who then shape policies in terms of their uh, particular ideas. And so, not surprisingly, you find a continuation even in the present administration today. But what's the result? Demonization. When you demonize people, what happens? When you demonize people, it becomes far more easier to enslave them and conquer them. I'll give you one example. In the 50s, the Mau Mau in Kenya, they were portrayed in offensive cartoons in the United Kingdom as having long dreadlocks and looking like monstrous beasts. What happened? It created a consensus in the minds of the British public that these were evil people. And so it set up the massacre of more than 7,000 Mau Mau. Same thing happened with the Jews during the Second World War. You had offensive cartoons, caricatures. It set them up for the gas chambers and the subsequent Holocaust. Once you demonize a community, it becomes far more easier to conquer them. And not surprisingly, the power behind people like Brzezinski, etc., basically their policies are implemented into the administration and they engage in their particular actions. And what does that do? It leads to endless massacres, killings. Historically, we find the Crusades. We find violence in the world today. Young children being mutilated. This was in the bombing campaigns in Iraq. People's heads being blown off. If you feel gross, just turn away. This is something called depleted uranium, used on babies in Iraq, and justified as a form of collateral damage. Why? Because it becomes easier to demonize a people, they become collateral damage, you can conquer them, enslave them, and kill them, regardless of what happened. Israeli soldiers pointing fingers at little children, massacres which are taking place in Gaza. Not surprisingly then, the rage that you see in the Muslim world takes or causes people to take 
polarized positions. So they then take extreme positions. They then basically support the extremists. And it's images like this that basically gives rise to extremism that you basically would find in different parts of the world. As you find here, killing children is an act of peace. Maybe in the minds of the corrupt world leaders, it might be an act of peace. But what do we as believing Christians and Muslims do about it? Do we just simply stand aside and allow the established order to run rampant, raping, killing, taking away our civil liberties? What do we do as individuals? Missionaries should be in the forefront of challenging the, just as, uh, the unjust status quo. But you find that more often than not, they go to third world countries, they go to Africa, they go to different parts of the world, and they become an appendage for the establishment. You become an appendage for the CIA. You become an appendage for the dominant global system. And something, of course, which goes against the roots of what Jesus himself taught, or for, example, or for that matter, Christianity. A nutshell is what I could unpack as being the academic and experiential mistrust. I'll just end with one particular quotation uh, on this particular point by an individual called Leo Strauss, who was the godfather of many of the neoconservatives you see in the world today. Strauss thought that the best way for the ordinary human beings to raise themselves above the beasts is to be utterly devoted to their nation and willing to sacrifice their lives for it. He recommended a rabid nationalism and a militant society model on ancient Sparta. He thought that this was the best hope for a nation to be secure against the external enemies as well as the internal ones to prevent the threat of sloth and pleasure. A policy of perpetual war or against a threatening enemy is the best way to ward off political decay. And if the enemy cannot be found, then the enemy must be invented. And so we create demons in societies, homeland security, the teller alert, high, severe, elevated. Of course you have people in, Muslim world, in the parts of the Muslim world who engage in extreme activity. But at the same time, you find that these boogies are basically placed before our eyes in order to justify ongoing war and to ward off political decay. Now, that's as far as the academic and experiential mistrust is concerned. The mistrust goes two ways, as John and I were discussing recently. It seems to me that in, his, in, in, in parts of the Muslim world, Muslims are indeed the first to point out how Islam instituted basic human rights in society, how it served as a liberating force, how it instituted the notions of tolerance and respect for human life and dignity in law. But everywhere you find in the Muslim world, you find that there is a lack of basic humanitarian concerns. Wherever there is a talk of reclaiming for religion, injustice, oppression and political violence are not far behind. Not surprisingly, in parts of Africa, people power are coming to the fore and taking over these countries which purportedly presented themselves to being Islamic and they are now obviously falling away because oppression, tyranny cannot last. It's quite interesting then how Western governments change their tunes. Initially we are in favor of Mubarak. Suddenly when there is a sudden transition the obvious change and support base changes. But it seems to me that it is in the contemporary quest for the Islamic State that we find the real humanitarian loss in terms of the spirit of Islam. Islam is an integrative worldview. That is, it integrates all aspects of reality by providing a moral perspective on how we should basically live our lives. It doesn't provide ready-made problems to or solutions to the problems of the world. But what it does do is provides a moral and just perspective within which we as individuals find the solutions to our problems. But the movements have made the fundamental error of perceiving Islam as a totalistic ideology. Once you perceive it as an ideology, then basically what happens? What happens? Humanitarian concerns fall away. Ideology is the antithesis of Islam. Ideology. It is the enterprise of suppression and not a force of liberation. Islam is an invitation to thought and analysis, not imitation and emotional and political freebooting. Ideology ensures that all mistakes and errors are perpetuated. Islam requires an open attitude where mistakes are freely admitted and so it cannot be molded into ideological boundaries. But when people mold it into ideological boundaries, that's when you find problems taking place in parts of the Muslim world. Like for example, you know, you, you find polemicists 
coming about and talking about something like the Sharia. And this is an individual called John Esposito, he wrote a book called Islam, The Straight Path. John might be obviously familiar with him, but he identifies the, um, the, 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 the development of the Sharia or the main theological distrust of Muslims by Christians concern not so much the fundamental sources of Islam, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, but the judicial interpretation of those sources. And that's where the problem lies. People can't define the two. I mean, you see debates all the time, and they talk about um, this is what Islam ordains. Islam ordains barbarism, etc., etc. But they don't make the distinction between the judicial interpretations of Islam and the Quran and the Sunnah, the Quran and the prophetic paradigm. If you look at the four primary schools of thought, the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Maliki, the Hanbali, all these particular schools of thought or schools of law were developed at a particular time by scholars who interpreted the primary sources of Islam in the light of their available knowledge. And so what they did, they developed the jurisprudence. You look at the Quran, you see problems in society, what do you do? You interpret the problems in accordance with the Quran and in accordance with your time. If you're living in the 10th century, you're going to interpret in accordance with the 10th century. If you're living in the 20th century, you're going to be in uh, interpreting in the relationship to the 20th century. What happened in Islamic history, or in Islamic law rather, was that the Imams stated that their rulings were their particular opinions. But the jurisprudence, which was developed at a particular point in time, became stagnated. And so what happens, particularly when the jurisprudence, or when the fiqh, assumed its systematic legal form during the time of the Abbasid period, what happened was that it incorporated the logic of Muslim imperialism of that particular time. Therefore, for example, the laws of apostasy, you know where people are executed as being apostates? Where does it say in the Quran that if you change your religion, we can kill you? It's not there. In fact, the Quran opens you to the idea of free thought. Let there be no compulsion in religion, for truth stands out distinct from falsehood. But in the jurisprudence, if it's part of your imperialist tradition, then per se it forms part of the jurisprudence as a result of which the world was easily divided. And so basically the law became stagnated. What happens in the 21st century when people, when individuals, when groups attempt to introduce or impose a jurisprudence that was developed in the 11th or 12th century, then the contradictions that were inherent in the formulation of the jurisprudence comes to the fore. But the challenge is, we have a principle in Islam called ijtihad, which is reasoned and sustained struggle to develop the law and apply it within the context of the 21st century. Unfortunately, Judaism does not have it. Because in Judaism, you'd find that the Torah, the Mithna, much of it is codified, and the codification exists in the source. And the source is the Torah, the Mithna. Here in Islamic law, the codification is in a secondary source. So it doesn't detract from the fact that the Quran can be used and implemented in the 21st century. You don't have that advantage in Judaism or the Judeo-Christian tradition. So it is in the post-Abbasid formulation of the jurisprudence that gives rise to Christian distrust of Muslims. Now the solution, the theological distrust, the solution, the solution is the following. We need to distinguish between different forms, between the Sharia, between Islamic law, and fiqh as three distinct entities. Sharia is a set of values that provide Muslim communities with eternal guidance. It's the path to the watering hole. It's your ethical paradigm that exists. Islamic law is what the Muslim community de derives from the Sharia. In other words, the law that develops. As you go to um, law school, you'd see laws develop all the time. Fiqh, which is classical jurisprudence, is what the classical Muslim jurists derive for their particular period. And the solution is finding the anomalies between the three and in doing so shaping a new society. We need to explore possible alternatives to evolve a tradition to challenge the postmodern age. While the Sharia does not change being the ultimate guidance from God, 
the jurisprudence continues to change as the situation changes. And so you'd have new challenges. What do you say about GM products? What do you say about um, uh, the pro proliferation of nuclear weaponry? What do you say about uh, social upliftment? What do you say about creating a just and moral social order which challenges a dominant uh, capitalist status quo? Unfortunately, missionary outfits do not provide you with that particular idea. I'm talking about the missionary outfits, particularly those that are sponsored and backed in Europe or by the United States. Of course, they're individual Christians that are sincere and honest um, and, 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 and akin somewhat to the liberation theology that you had in Latin America. But by and large, they are not ready to solve the problems of our particular time. Both groups, then, have to fight the imperialism of their own traditions and move away from servile conformity to apathetic non-committal where their worldviews can be meaningful. Christianity has to end its marriage with secularism. It has to. You know, I see people proudly standing and speaking about the division between the church and the, and, and the state. So in other words, you accept the status quo. You leave the politics to the politicians. And with the result, you find the ongoing oppression. Christianity must recover its marriage to secularism. Islam obviously needs to recover, or particularly in the Muslim world, recover the lost humanity and finding the distinction in terms of the anomalies that exist in the jurisprudence and the interpretation. Any work that involves the creation of a genuine Muslim and Christian responses to contemporary reality directly challenges the status quo. Pluralism. You see, a dominant myth of our time is that pluralism is only possible in the worldview of secularism. But secularism maintains this fallacy only so long as non-secularist worldviews conforms to its dictates. And how do you conform to its dictates? You conform to its dictates if you take absolutist positions. If you believe that you are going to heaven and the whole world is going to hell, so who cares? Let them all go to hell now. Who cares about them? If you take absolutist positions, you play directly into the hands of secularism. You need to move away from that. What would Jesus do in the 21st century? Would he find himself appended to a mission and uh, be backed by organizations like the Wycliffe Bible Translation? Or would he find himself in direct opposition with the status quo of different governments and leaders in the 21st century? So, the notion of freedom without responsibility is an article of faith that secularists defend. Such a creed cannot promote genuine pluralism, because genuine pluralism means that we have to surrender our power over others in order to show, ensure that they have the same freedom as we have for ourselves. And primarily that would mean coming together in cooperation, or rather understanding. Understanding that there are differences between us, but that there is an ethical paradigm. I'll probably discuss that tomorrow and unpack that in terms of how Muslims can be Muslims and Christians can be Christians together in the worship of the one and only God and reshape society. The purpose of Christian-Muslim cooperation is to seek a joint understanding, or should be rather, of the will of God and to shape the human world and human history in accordance with that particular will. In both Christianity and Islam, you'd find that the nature and the activity of God have been held to determine not only the context of ethics and spirituality, but also idealization or creation of an ethical society. In other words, the task before us is to take these ethics that you can derive from only the monotheistic understanding of God and apply it to the ongoing structures of the particular world. If we cannot do that, then unfortunately all believers will be endangered species and will soon be eradicated and our fates will be destined for the dustbin of history. But it's something that we as individuals need to relook, introspect, 
Take a self-critiquing model. Just don't take absolutist positions. If you take absolutist positions, then you're setting yourself up for destruction. Not just in the hereafter, but also in this particular world here as well. We need to basically see where we can get together in terms of how we reshape our world, how we reshape society. Martin Luther King Jr. once made a statement where he said that in terms of asking issues and challenging issues, cowardists ask the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. And if we can do that, you will find that human history has now reached a particularly interesting turning point, which gives us our main reason for hope. Under the passions, problems, and predicaments of the 20th century, you find that the secular worldview has collapsed. If we do not take the opportunities of reshaping the world, then we will find, unfortunately, that the world will be reshaped in accordance with a particular ideal or system which is totally incorrect or not against our particular worldview. How much time do I have? Three minutes? If you could take a concept such as fundamentalism per se, people normally use this term interchangeably with Muslims, Islamic fundamentalism. Again, it's an incorrect assertion because fundamentalism as a movement arose particularly in the United States among certain Presbyterian theologians at Princeton University. And what they did in the light of the Enlightenment and higher criticism, they wrote a series of booklets called the Fundamentals emphasizing Christian doctrine and Christian doc uh, dogma as a result of which they were described or called as the fundamentalists. It had its root in the Niagara Bible Conference in 1878, which defined those tenets which considered fundamental to Christian belief. And of course, we talk about the fundamentalist modernist controversy, etc., that subsequently took place. This is someone called Mahmoud Mamdani. He wrote a book called America, the Cold War, and the Roots of Terror. The title is Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. And he said that I have doubts about the usage of the term fundamentalism outside of the context in which it arises, which is the Christian context. My real discomfort with using the two interchangeably, political Islam and Islamic fundamentalism, is that fundamentalism is a cultural phenomenon, and I want to zero in on a political Political phenomenon. Political Islam arising in the context of oppression, in the context of decades of sanguinary warfare, in the context of tyranny, in the context of mass murder, in the context of genocide. It is a reaction, but that came very late in human history, as late as the latter part of the 70s. It's important that when we define each other as human beings, that we need to be sensitive in terms of the terminologies that we use in applying to each other. Otherwise, again, we fall into the trap of the secularist enterprise. That's what the secularist worldview wants us to accept. You fall into the trap and you become a slave to your master. And if you want to be true liberated, true liberation drives in maintaining an interpretative relationship with your faith meaningfully in the sense in terms of which you apply the terms, the passages and the divine parameters in the context of reshaping 21st century society. So, in conclusion then, in accordance with what Martin Luther King Jr. says, we need to sometimes take positions which might not be popular, introspective positions, self-critiquing positions, but take them because it is right. I'd end with a verse of the Quran which says, وَقُلْ جَعَ الْحَقْ وَزَحْقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَحُقَ And it simply means that when truth hurls itself against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, any form of falsehood is bound to perish. Thank you very much for your attentive hearing and God bless you. Thank you, sir, for your 
presentation, I'd like to call upon John Gilchrist, 